Thank you everyone for uh, joining us today to discuss replacing SQL triggers with IDMS tasks. This is going to be recorded, so you will get the recording afterwards. But like any webinar, if you have any questions, feel free to use that chat or IQA or uh, <laughs> Q and A <laughs> uh, functionality found in Zoom, and we'll address those throughout the presentation. I am JT Fiedler. I'm the product and sales advisor here at CSI, and I'm joined by Doug Morris, who's the founder and chief product officer here at CSI. Everything that we will be covering in today's webinar works with both IMS 2017 and IMS EMS. So if you're on IMS 2017, you can implement these features today and they'll continue to work when you migrate to IMS EMS. And we love to include the present that some of you might be aware of, but we have a present that we will review at the end. We also have some exciting uh, news coming towards the end of September with this present. Uh, it's going to get a new enhancement to it. So we're really excited about that. So be on the lookout for that to be released. And with that, I'm going to pass things over to Doug to kind of talk about IDMS and kind of the impact it has within the IMS community. Doug, over to you. Thanks, JT. Um, <clears throat> so right now we have well over 300 IMS customers that are using the data management suite uh, to replace both stored procedures and triggers. Uh, we had a lot of people actually doing the triggers already. And then we realized, hey, you know, the world doesn't know about this. So that's why we're doing this. Um, and so I pestered development, <clears throat> excuse me. And I said, how many tasks and, you know, how many tasks are being invoked every day? And right now there's over 3,200 every day that are being invoked. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we did this webinar for Australia last night. 1,200 of them actually are in the AP uh, Azure data center, which is pretty cool. So a uh, little, little push to the US here. We got to we should be kicking their butt and they're kicking our butt. So when I say US, sorry, I'm also including you guys in Canada and you guys in the UK. And, uh, uh, you know, there we go. There's my first inappropriate thing that I'll say in this webinar. It won't be the uh, last. So um, look, here's the deal. We're going to get a little uh, competitive here. There are some people out there saying, oh, we can replace stored procedures and triggers. Nothing is going to do it as easy as the data management suite. We've designed this product to be very end user friendly. We have a full set of documentation. We have two and a half people standing by waiting for your support call. Uh, we are serious about this. We want to make it easy. We want to provide support. And one of the other things that the competition doesn't tell you is the more you use their product, the more you pay. Uh, that's not the case with the data management suite. We've had some of our... Uh, some of the solution providers out there have really used it quite a bit uh, when they bring in data conversions, but we have a lot of clients that are using it constantly and they don't pay extra. Um, with some of the competing products out there, the more you use it, uh, the more you pay. But enough of that. <clears throat> IDMS tasks, right? The things we're talking about, they can be called, about this whole webinar, of course, is when a rise page loads, or you can even put them behind a button so you can say, click here to refresh, and it'll actually invoke a IDMS task. And so that's really what we're going to show here. And then you can also call them from workflow automation tools like Power Automate, Cron Hooks is a really cool tool as well. Uh, JT is going to show you um, how to call IDMS tasks from Power Automate. And the amazing thing is if you're a Microsoft shop, you're using Microsoft stuff, you probably already have Power Automate. Although we have a Power Automate add-on, we're not going to talk about that today. In fact, I went to JT and I said, you can't show our add-on, right? Just show Power Automate and show how to call an IDMS task, two things that most people on this call will have. Let's talk a little bit about why we want to do an IDMS task. First off, <clears throat> why we want to call it, why we want to trigger it, if you will. It's about efficiency is really what it's about. Um, you don't you want to do the work and only the work you need to do. So if you need something to happen when a person checks out, you just want to do it. You don't want to rely on five and 10 minute scripts. They're yesterday. 
Look, I'm looking in the mirror here. CSI has written a lot of five and 10 minute scripts for our customers over the years because we wanted to avoid putting triggers in SQL. We're in a new cloud friendly world and we can trigger things from the outside. So we don't have to hide stuff in SQL anymore and getting in the way of IMIS and all those fun things. So five and 10 minute scripts are yesterday. Don't do them anymore because, hey, they drain resources. They're constantly running. They're going over and over again. And here's the deal. Even if you have a five minute script, someone's got to wait for it. Okay. So if it's like I click now, I could wait up to four minutes and 99 seconds until that script runs. That's a long time when you're sitting there waiting for something to happen. Now, <clears throat> sorry to pick on the competition again, but they go and say, oh, you can trigger all these things. You can't. The only way to trigger something from IMIS right now is to use their webhook uh, functionality and it's not finished yet. So when they say they can trigger, they're not. They're going and they're pinging the database constantly to see if there were changes. And so about every five minutes they go, any change, any change, that puts a drain on your database. It makes it slower. Same thing these five and 10 minute scripts used to do. They slow things down and it's not a good way to do it. So they're not manually triggered. They are just querying the database, constantly looking for changes. That's not an efficient way. The only efficient way to trigger from IMIS is to either do it from RISE, like we're going to show you, or outside of there until their webhook functionality. Okay, enough picking on people. I thought this was funny, so I added it in here. <clears throat> um, we throw slides in here about efficiency and whatnot. And uh, I thought, well, gosh, I'm going to grab uh, a great efficiency slide from Adobe uh, Stock Images that we subscribe to. Uh, these are the slides that popped up when I typed in efficiency. Uh, as JT said, there's a pregnant woman in there. I'm like, I have no idea, but this guy was everywhere, right? An unkept uh, guy in a suit that's kind of uh, slouching on his uh, little uh, iPad, it looks like. I don't understand this, but I thought it was kind of funny. Um, so we'll just keep going here. <clears throat> okay. Why doesn't everybody do triggers? Look, we're going to show you how to do triggers today. We're going to give you this PowerPoint. We're going to give you all the tools you need. But the fact is, it's a little more work than just scheduling a script that runs or a task that runs every hour, or every five minutes. Okay. It does take more work and it takes, therefore, a touch more technical knowledge. And like I said, it's just not as easy. But a couple of rules of the road, right? You don't have to be a developer. JT and I are not developers. I do head up our product direction here at CSI. I was a former developer. I'm not a developer today. I'm a good SQL guy, but that's about it. And that's going out the door. So heads up, everything you see today was done by, as we like to say, mere mortals. Uh, I'm a huge fan of, fan of ChatGPT. You can use this to help you on these things, right? You're going to be writing some JavaScript, a little scary. You can put it in there and it'll help you figure out what's not working. Our listserv is designed to let users help users. Click, go to that link. Sorry, you can't click on it. Go to that link and sign up for our listserv today, okay? Um, you can go and say, listen, uh, I saw this great webinar by uh, someone and uh, CSI um, <clears throat> and uh, loved it but I'm stuck. I'm trying to write my first trigger from Rise and it's not working. I'm getting this weird error. Post it out there and your peers will help. Remember, we have support too. Okay, you do you do need to know how to write an IQA and you need to know how to add content to Rise. If you don't know that, the IMIS Learning Subscription ILS is awesome. It will teach you all of that stuff. But these are things that you're gonna need to know in this new day and age. And then, hey, if you know how to use the Chrome developer tools, that's a plus, all right? Okay. Let's go do it. Here we go. Ready? Here we go. All right. We're going to do something cool. And I want to add people. Um, and my friend Keith sort of gave me this idea. He's like, I need to add people to a committee when something happens. And I said, all right, here's what I'm going to do. I want to add someone to my new member committee whenever they join the organization. And so that's what I decided to do. So the first thing we're going to do and by the way, I'll go through all of this. We're going to do it live. And there's a slide for every one thing. We'll go through it. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to need my IQA, right? We're going to be using iUpdate and I've got to have my IQA. All right. So let's go look at it. OK. 
Did he? I was in here earlier. It should be warmed up. It's not. My bad. All right, here we go. New member details with ID prompt. I'm going to make an IQA that says, I want to pass an ID. And when this ID is passed, it's going to return some information. Okay. So what are my sources? My sources are pretty straightforward. I'm just using net contact data. By the way, a little shout out, do not use net contact. If you are in an IQA and you see net contact being used, get it out of there. It's net contact data or net contact basic. Otherwise, you're not cool. My filters. Remember, I want to pass a parameter. So I'm going to say, look, I want the ID passed. And then I also want the join date to be today. And that's important because this task is going to be called whenever someone checks out. And I really don't want it adding anybody who checks out to become a new member on the new member committee. So I'm adding a little filter in here. All right. And then my display. Well, a couple interesting things in here. So the first off is we have my ID. Fine. But then I have a couple formulas here. And I want to talk a real brief moment about these formulas. Um, and we're going to do this super high tech. We're going to use the old notepad. Okay, you see this DBO ASI get app date time. That gets us the current date and time. And that is what you should be using these days. You do not want to use get date, a SQL function, because if you are on EMS and you are hosted by ASI, your server might be hosting people on the West Coast, uh, Central, and Eastern. So there's a setting in RISE that adjusts for your current time zone. So that is the way to get the current date and time. Now, I really, even though I wrote current date time here, I really only wanted the date, right? I want to be cool. So I just did a cast around it. Try not to use format, please. Just use cast. And I say cast as date. So that's going to turn it into the date. So that's going to get me my current date and time. So we're doing a little SQL training here, right? The other thing I want my IQA to return is what about one year from now? So I really want to add this person to the new member committee starting today, and I want them off the new member committee in one year. So I need to know what one year from today is. So notice we've got this as a starting point, okay? But really what we want to do is add in a date, add. And I, by the way, Google can help with this. Chat GPT can help with this. How do I add one year to today's date using SQL? So it's date, add. I want to go a year. I want one year from now. And then I'm going to reuse my formula. And then there's a close here. So. That's all these two things do. Wanted to just show you that. There's a lot of cool stuff you can do with SQL and make these. But I needed an IQA that gave me back stuff that I can use in iUpdate. <clears throat> okay. So there we go. If we were to run this and I were to put in some random ID who didn't join today, I'm not going to get any results. So this is only going to turn, return a result if the join date matches today um, <clears throat> and the ID of that ID. So, okay, we've got our IQA. Life is good. Let's go create our task in the data management suite. I'm going to use iUpdate for this. Notice this cloud ID, cool little thing here. You may have seen it before. Uh, really interesting thing about IDMS, it can actually talk to databases that aren't yours. So if you wanted to pull stuff from your staging or test database, you could do that. If you're in a federated environment where you need to pull stuff from your chapters, you can do that as well. So little pro thing, we added a way back to allow IDMS to grab data from other IMS databases. But we're going to stay in my current IMS database. I'm going to go out there and grab that really cool IQA I just showed you. And new member details with ID prompt. It says, okay, you've got an ID and join date in there as parameters. Great. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do an insert update. And I'm going to tell you why. You're thinking, hey, Doug, I should just do an insert, right? Why do I need to do an insert update? Well, I'm going to show you why I'm doing it this way. I'm going to do insert update. Now, notice when I hit go, it doesn't let me go forward. I've made my ID prompt required. So IDMS is like, I need an ID in there. I won't move forward. So I have to trick it because I don't want to actually save this ID in there, but I have to save that because IDMS is trying to be protective of me and saying the ID is required. I'm not going to let you go forward. So I'm going to put a fake ID in there now and I'm going to hit insert update. I've actually done all my mappings. Your time's valuable, so I'm not going to waste it, right? Here is my mappings. Let's go over them really quick. I'm using the committee activity. 
I'm hard coding the committee code. It's going to go on the new member committee. I'm putting the ID in there. So I'm mapping on those two things. I have to set my position code to what position that person's going to be. I need to know when they term out. Well, that's that field I'm using for my IQA. Kind of cool. I need to know when they start. That's the current date time, even though I've stripped off time. So it's a really straightforward thing. I'm going to add them to this. But now I'm going to go down into my current options. <clears throat> the first thing is don't update records. Insert only when no match is found. This says, look, if they happen to check out twice that day, don't add them to the committee twice. Just go and insert if they've not, if they're not already on this committee. Cool. Then the next thing, if you get one thing out of this webinar, Turn this on. If you don't have this turned on, if you're a newer client, you already have it turned on. We haven't gone back and flipped all the other switches. Turn this on. Skip update if more than one record found. We have lots of people that say, I want to update a committee, and then they forget to put the committee code in, and they update every activity in their database, which is always a lot of fun. Turn this on. It will save you from making bad mistakes. Okay, everybody turn that on. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to schedule this as a task. I'm not really scheduling it as a task. It's just a task I need to run. So I could say new member uh, activity uh, creation, whatever I might want to do. I'm not going to put a schedule in here. This is an on-demand task. This is a great thing you can do with the data management suite. But in this case, I'm just going to save it. And it warns me. It says, hey, this task is not going to run unless manually scheduled. Okay. So what we have there is now my new member activity creation. And I'm going to now, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and edit the mapping. I'm going to click on my IQA. I'm going to get that one, two, three out of there, right? I don't want that in there. So I've got to go back and override that back to the schedule and hit save. So a quick little thing. We're going to do that. So we're all done. It's saved. Okay. Last but not least, we're going to go back to where we were. We're going to find that. We're going to hit the little eyeball. And this is where you have your triggers. We have two types. We have an asynchronous one that JT is going to talk about. But from Rise, I want to use the standard fire and forget. So you grab that. This is the webhook that allows this task to run from the outside world. And that is the most important thing. And you all have it. You've had it since you've had iUpdate and iSchedule. There it is. It's right there. Today, we're actually going to show you how to use it. Okay, so we've grabbed that webhook. Everything's great. We're going to go back to IMAS. And now we're going to go and I'm going to edit my checkout page and I'm going to add some content to it. So I'm going to go to manage content. And I'm going to go to my store and I'm going to go to my order confirmation page and I'm going to hit edit. And notice I've already done it here. I'll show you what I did. I added some content. I added a content.html iPart, the simplest of iParts. And then in the HTML, I pasted this. So I'll give you a minute to write that down. Go ahead, everyone, quick, write it down. I'm just kidding. We're actually going to give you a download that has this all in it. This is where I would actually put that webhook that I had just pasted. I would paste it right in here. I'm not going to do it because I'm actually, oh, I just broke it, JT. All right, so there we go. It's right there. So notice what this says is we're going to grab the ID. We're grabbing the ID from the client context. That's a thing ASI makes public. So when you're on that page, it's actually known who the ID of that person is. We're going to go ahead and call that webhook, and we're going to pass the IMS ID. It's all right in here. And then this is the most important thing. My friend Travis with Causes was helping me learn all this earlier this week. He forgot the run task thing. That was uh, a little embarrassing. But anyway, my bad. So run task, I have my content in here. So if we look at this, it is my checkout page that has some content on it. All right, well, how does that all work? Let's take a look. I'm going to go ahead now and I'm going to join. So membership. And we're going to go to membership. There we go. And I want to be a regular. So I'm just using the out-of-box demo site from ASI. Wonderful. There's a little bug in it that annoys me. We'll talk about that in a minute. So I'm going to just join as a regular member. Add to cart. Proceed to checkout. And I'm going to create a new account. And we're going to put some stuff in here. So it's going to be JT uh, 
I made him Weebler yesterday. I'm going to do, uh, let's see, Ebler. Okay, there we go. JT, we just took off the feed. The, no, no F. So you're, okay. J Ebler at uh, example.com. And we'll just put in his CSI address. Life is good. I'm not even going to put a power. I have to put a password in, which really stinks um, because it's going to erase my password in a minute. Let me hit save. And it says, oh, wait, your address. Do you want to use the same address you put in? Yes, I do. I'm, and now it makes me put this all back in again. All right. Save. JT has joined. This is great. On the checkout page that's going to come up here in a minute. Remind me to cycle through this. Here we go. We're going to put this in. On the next page, that content that I added is going to be called. It's going to run that task, and it's going to call that IDMS task. So as he checks out, you don't see anything on here, but it is called the IDMS task. So this is really cool. If it worked, right? Go over here. We're going to go and find him. There he is. Great. He's now a regular member. He has joined. And in a perfect world, if I go to activity, he is now on that committee. A little scary. New member committee as of today, and he expires at the end in one year. And it happened today. So I've added him to that committee simply by calling, but by someone ending up on a page in Rise. Could make a button there. A button could have been like add to committee. I could have done that as well, but I just did this. So that is a super simple way to do that. Like I said, a little harder than scheduling, but not that hard. JT is going to send you this PowerPoint, right? We have all the steps that I use to make the IQA, all those cool formulas I just taught you. All the steps we're going to do one by one, putting in the fake ID, using insert and update because it allows me to say insert only, never update, which is good. Making my key fields of new member and ID and using the fields from my IQA. My important do not update, insert only, and the skip update if more than one record found. We're saving without putting in a schedule. We're going back and erasing that ID. We're grabbing the URL and we want the standard fire and forget URL. We're adding an HTML content I part. It has this stuff in here. Here is how you get that. So HTTPS uh, CSI.MS forward slash IDMS trigger will give you all of this right now. You can go download this. This is the code you will use to trigger and pass ID. If you want to pass something else, so JT was passing an email address in his example, you could do the same sort of thing. You would just switch this stuff out to be email. Really easy. There might be a little trial and whatnot. If you know how to use the Chrome uh, tools, they'll tell you what you're doing wrong, which is kind of cool. So um, there is the trigger to get you all this. And I published the page and then you saw it work. Now, we're going to turn it over to JT. It's my favorite picture of JT. I said, look surprised, and I took his picture. Uh, we are going to turn it over to JT, and the reason we're going to turn it over to JT is he's going to show you Power Automate. We're excited about Power Automate because you already have it. You don't need to buy our IMUS connector. We're happy if you do. But Power Automate uh, is a tool you have today that you can start using for automation, and it's probably free because you probably already have it with your Office subscription. And he's going to show you how to call a task using Power Automate. So, JT. Yes, thank you, Doug. So like Doug previously mentioned, there's those two URLs. And so I wanted to kind of explain the difference between the two. So the first one is that standard fire and forget URL. So this is going to be kind of that normal job functionality, original unchanged behavior. And so this webhook type will not, one, wait for the I uh, update job to finish, to tell you if the iUpdate job succeeded or failed uh, at the end. And lastly, tell you how many records it actually retrieved and processed. 
So those are some things to be aware of. On the other hand is the asynchronous polling URL. So this is the newer kind of wait for completion functionality that is better support for external tooling using like Microsoft Power Automate or the cronhooks.io uh, tool. And the only caveat here is that it's not going to wait for the job to complete before returning the HTTP response. So jobs can take much longer than the maximum HTTP timeout value. So that is something to be aware of. So taking a look at the standard URL and using that within Power Automate. First, you'll want to select the HTTP action in Power Automate. And that's gonna bring you to kind of this screen. And we'll want to have the method we use be the post method. So we'll select that from the dropdown. And then similar to where Doug had copy and pasted the URL, you'll just go into iSchedule, click the little eyeball icon and get the correct URL and post it into this field within Power Automate. And then from there, you can add those following steps of what you want it to do and continue to build out that workflow. If you were to use the asynchronous URL, you have kind of that same initial setup. And so you're once again going to use that HTTP action in Power Automate. You'll then again select the post method, copy and paste that given uh, webhook asynchronous URL. And then this is where it differs a little bit. You'll want to ensure that asynchronous pattern is on. And so how you get there is you click those little three dot menu and it's gonna bring you to the settings. And so once you open the settings, you'll want to make sure that asynchronous pattern is toggled on. And then with the asynchronous polling, you're going to be able to retrieve those uh, status or the results. And in this case, you can see the row count, uh, the percentage com of completion, and it gives you kind of those insights there. So like Doug mentioned, he gave me uh, probably an hour uh, to come up with an example of how we can implement this. And the most important part is while we do have that IMIS Power Automate connector, we wanted to show you how to use it in a sample use case without needing that. So this is just a simple example that I will go ahead and walk through, but it is essentially triggering unlocking user accounts. And when we did this webinar last night, Someone asked, why wouldn't you just schedule that to run? And in this case, you could schedule it. That would be the easier route. However, it's kind of that every hour. So this is going to act more of a trigger uh, and be able to unlock the account right away. So with that, I'll go ahead and jump into it. So this is just the workflow. So we have a form out there for locked out. So we just created a simple form with email and username. So nothing special. And what we're going to do is we're going to get those response details from that given form. And then we have our task. So once again, we went in, got the task from our iSchedule uh, unlock user accounts. And then in this case, I took it a step further just so you can see it be completed. I use the two as my own email. However, you could have it be sent to the email that was on the form. So the person who submitted that uh, form can get an email. So if we take a quick look, we have here is just a sign out and we'll go ahead and sign in. And we will go ahead and lock Sarah's account out. And so we'll just enter these. 
And so now the account's locked out. So what Sarah can do is we could add a button here to link to this form, but we'll just put in the username as well as the email. And we'll go ahead and hit submit. And so what this is doing is it is now running the task in IDMS. And on my other screen, we have gotten an email saying, hi, if this account is associated with an email or this email, you are now unlocked. And so to see that, if we go back to this screen, if we attempt to sign in again, you'll see that it is now allowing Sarah to attempt to sign in again. One thing to mention as well is I'm using the IDMS task and having a form. You could take it a step further and have just a button down here or a link that they click that would go ahead and launch that job. So you could have, if you lock yourself out, click here. And once they click that, it would then go and trigger that job to run and unlock their account so they can try again. All right, so we um, in Asia Pacific, a lot of most people are already on EMS, but here in the US, we're still converting. Uh, what we're really hoping today is use JT's famous slide here about the hurdles you're facing today. <clears throat> um, uh, one of the people that's actually on this call, I know she's got a lot of triggers still to get rid of. And that was one of the reasons why we did this uh, webinar. Uh, we've got our legacy processes. I'm amazed I've, we're, we're transitioning a client that I've worked with since 1995, back when I was eight. Um, and, you know, in those days, we printed out everything and sent it to them to fill and update their profile, right? So a lot of their processes are legacy, right? Where we're an internet enabled world where we actually trust our members to type things in correctly. We're getting rid of those. Then we go to our customizations and we find out which ones are needed and aren't needed. And then finally, our stored procedures and or triggers, we're going to get rid of those and put them into more sustainable way. So we're excited about removing all of these migration hurdles, and we're only helping with the last two. So a uh, little heads up there. Our documentation uh, just got a refresh. We're trying to put better examples out there. It is docs.csiinc.com. We'd love feedback on that. I happen to know uh, the young man who worked on it over the summer because I'm driving him back to college on Friday. Um, and at the end, uh, by the way, I'll say this on the couch the other night. He says, you know, I should have asked for a raise. My documentation is going to save your support team so many calls. And instead of strangling him, I said, well, what if no one uses the documentation? Maybe I should cut your salary. So a uh, little punk. Um <clears throat> Sorry, um, I did say the second part. Uh, Docs.csinc.com, we'd love your feedback on that. We have a listserv. Watch this arrow pop in. That's the thing I talked about before. Please sign up. Please ask questions. This is not a tech support thing unless you're looking for tech support from your uh, peers. Uh, if you are truly having an issue, please use support at csiinc.com. All right, here we go. I'm as experienced plus. This is the gift we offered you. Uh, this was, uh, as JT said, this is getting a really, really cool thing at the end of September. Uh, we will be uh, where I don't even want to get into it. Something cool is happening and it's going to blow your mind and it's going to cost big zero, just like this. This is a Chrome and Edge add in that we were one of the uh, top winners in the Hack Day Award that ASI did about a year and a half ago. Um, if you don't have this, I'm expecting a lot of people on this to have it. If you don't, go ahead and download it. If you don't like it, you can turn it off. But let's go through what it does. Okay, first off, developers at CSI can never leave well enough alone. They've got to make stuff prettier. So, boom. You now I have these really cool things out there. And it looks better. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. But you're like, all right, Doug, I'm not really going to download a Chrome add-in for that. But wait, there's more. Okay, how many times have you forgotten to hit that silly plus button, right? 
and you know it, you end up saying an inappropriate word. If you're working at home, your kids learn that word. They take it to school. They start using that word. It gets popular at school. Next thing you know, you're getting a call from the principal and it's all because of Imus. Okay. So we wanted to stop that from happening. And that plus button was silly. Boom. Now it's a commit button, right? You can't go anywhere unless you commit it. Okay. And so we've turned that into a commit button. I think that is just one of the greatest things we could have done such a simple little thing. Uh, the amount of swearing uh, by IMIS users has decreased over 50% per what we've uh, noticed. Okay. But wait, there's more. Ever add SQL to an IQA just like I did and then make a mistake and you have to go and copy the property. You have to go re-add it and delete it. Well, Jake went and said, how about we give them an edit button? So now you have an edit button and you can go edit your SQL down there and change the date uh, or change the SQL or whatever and just re-add it. So if you are playing around and adding SQL, this will help. Uh, it is not perfect. Sometimes that edit button doesn't show. We kind of have to guess whether it's a formula or not. We're going to try and work with ASI to actually allow us to identify that better. But sometimes the browser add-in uh, just can't tell uh, what's in there. So uh, those are the cool things. Now, JT, tell us how to get this. Yes. So there's two options you have to get this extension. One is through the Chrome Web Store. And if you go into the Chrome Web Store, you just search Chrome Web Store and start typing IMUS, you'll see the IMUS Experience Plus. And if you select that, this is where it's located. So you would add to Chrome and be able to have this functionality right away. And if you use Edge, similar process, you would just go to the Edge add-on store and once again, search IMUS and select the IMUS Experience Plus and get that add-in that way. So with All right. that, <clears throat> We've had some questions. I've answered a couple. Um, Jason is asking, can we trigger an iTransfer job so we can send a post call to an external API? I believe the answer to that is yes. Um, yes. And if not, uh, Jason, we will, um, we will, I'll create a, a quick little ticket and we will send that to you. But the answer should be yes. If not, it will be yes. Um, so, because they use all the same thing. So, um, let's see here. Uh, uh, that was a Microsoft form JT was using Ooh, another great thing. You get power automate probably for free. You also get Microsoft forms. JT just did something for one of our customers where he actually created a Microsoft form that actually had branching logic in it. So it was almost like a whole survey but he was able to capture all of that data from the Microsoft form, drop into Power Automate and do stuff with it. So JT is our product sales guy. He's also, believe it or not, our Power Automate uh, person. He's amazing at it. Uh, he will be the first to tell you he didn't get a computer science degree. He just uses it. And the, what he showed you on this webinar, I did give him one hour yesterday. He just got back from a conference. We were doing this for the AP. And I said, I want you to do a power automate example, not using our connector. And I told him what to do. And he did that whole thing. So um, how's forms response mapped with the HTTP API? I mean, to field mapping. JT, you want to talk about how you map the form response? Yes. So essentially everything is just going in and I can just show it. So it's just going to use the fields that are in the uh, form. So just that email and uh, I think username. And it's just going to be trying to find the email uh, tied to the job or like it's going to execute that job in the IMS data management suite. So it's going to run that job using a query in IMIS that we have set up to find those locked out users. So if results are returned, it's going, and this is essentially just saying, go run this job and it's going to unlock those user accounts and send them. And where did you pass the user account at? I think that might be his question. 
So I use standard. So if you wanted to pass the uh, email or username, similar to what Doug had, you would put it in this uh, body section and put in. Oh, go back to body. That's what he's looking for. Notice what's popping up in there. All of the stuff that he was asking. Yes. So you can use these from previous steps and filter. Yes. Out. It's a great thing about Power Automate. The step can finish with more data and you can now use that data and use data from previous steps and whatnot. All sorts of fun things. And Keith points out, what if someone's trying to hack an account? Well, here's the deal. Uh, really fun. We uh, actually lock people out of our cloud after 15 tries, uh, maybe 12. Um, it's a little bit like iPhone. Really what I was looking to do there is stop... Uh, to not get in the way of the normal people and stop the bad people. Notice we used to say bad guys. Now we have to be appropriate and say bad people. So um, here we go. That's the third dumb thing I've said. Uh, so we have, um, if someone's going to go lock themselves out, go over to that form and try it again, and then go fill that out. Uh, you know what? That's not going to be easily done by a brute force attack. But if you feel like it is, you could drop a uh, recapture on that form as well. And that would slow them down even more. So I can't tell you what uh, level of security you should use or what level of security you need. But I will tell you this. Uh, we always try to balance security with uh, not uh, ruining your member donors and prospective members experience. So uh, that's at least the goal there. So just make sure everyone's on the same. <laughs> yes, only three. Well, Keith, the second one I didn't bring up, but there were two that I admit to. I will get some stuff. The one of the other webinars, they said, Doug keeps calling JT stupid. So um, JT, you are not stupid. I'm sorry if I ever called you that. There's four. Okay. Uh, you never called me. You just remind everybody <laughs> that I'm not a programmer. And yeah, but that doesn't mean you're stupid. You're a smart guy, right? Love working with you. You know, you're a smart guy. You're smart because you work at CSI. What can I say? <laughs> There's five. Okay. <laughs> support. Any questions you have, there is no charge for our support. It is included with your subscription. JT can be reached at sales. You want to find out about our Power Automate connector. You want to do anything like that. Our online documentation revamped courtesy of George Morris, docs.csinc.com. We'd love to hear about that. You run into any issue, you can put it there. Uh, and of course, our listserv, we got JT, you're supposed to add this. See, you're supposed to add that here, our listserv. Boom, please use it. We are publishing to that now weekly. Billy, who heads up our product support team, publishes some tidbits out there every week now. Um, so... There we go. Thank you very much for giving up the, uh, the last 43 minutes of your day. We appreciate it. Uh, JT, we'll be sending out a survey. We'd love to hear what we could do better uh, and uh, any feedback you have. So thank you very much. Yes. Thanks, everyone.